Orthodoxy is growing in America, and people are noticing. All glory to God and his servants. Patristic faith is becoming a powerhouse for spreading orthodoxy. In part one, we had many amazing stories. Now it is time for part two. America has historically been a Protestant nation with a Catholic minority formed by waves of immigrants coming from Europe to America looking for a better life, for opportunity, freedom from persecution so they can practice their religion. Now some of these groups were Russians, Greeks, Serbians, Romanians, Bulgarians, and when they came they brought the true faith with them. But Orthodoxy also has roots in America. We have St. Herman and St. Innocent and their mission to the Alaskan people and the Aleuts. We have St. Peter the Aleut. We have local American saints, and in more modern recent times, we have St. Sebastian of Jackson, we have St. John Maximovich, and Seraphim Rose. America and the West are at a tipping point right now. We are seeing the ends of Western Christianity as the Catholic Church changes and reverses all of their teachings, giving in to paganism, giving in to the world. And Protestantism, from its very start, it has caused endless schism. It has only caused more problems. People in the West are spiritually malnourished. They want to be fed, they want God, but they're not finding it in Western Christianity because Western Christianity has removed the essence of Christianity from it. So people are lost, they're seeking, and some of them end up in things like Pentecostalism, this hyper-emotionalism, this euphoria. It leads them into pre They want to feel alive in their faith. It's quite ironic because people say orthodoxy is dead, but orthodoxy is quite literally the only thing that brings life. It is alive. The Orthodox Church produces saints. It has the grace. When you remove relics, icons, incense, the saints, the sacraments from Christianity, that's not Christianity anymore. When you say miracles, oh, that's just hap something that happened a long time ago. There's no more miracles. That's atheism. That isn't Christianity. Orthodoxy is alive. Miracles happen every day. We have myrrh bearing icons that you can go and see for yourself because orthodoxy is living. It is the ark of salvation. When you subvert tradition in the Bible to make it fit modern things, you're not following Christianity. You're following yourself when you think, oh, we can have women priests, we can have women pastors. Oh, the Eucharist, that's just a symbol. All these things is just symbol. You're not following Christianity. And that is why everyone is joining the Orthodox Church. People are tired of the shenanigans of the modern world. And it's not just Protestants, it's not just Catholics, it's atheists too. It's Muslims, it's Hindus, it's Buddhists. I have met people of every background and that is the point of this video. I'm gonna show you why Americans are converting to Orthodox Christianity. If you wanna watch the full interviews or share your story, check out my channel, The Orthocast. Now the interviews that I have, it's overrepresented by YouTubers. It doesn't represent all, everyone who's converting. I have met people from all backgrounds who are converting to the Orthodox faith. Now we're gonna hear from some Americans on their upbringing and how they found Holy Orthodoxy raised uh, Protestant on my dad's side, go bouncing around to all the different churches. We got to find a church that teaches the Bible, you know, that's with ju just the Bible, get rid of all that other nonsense. Like yeah. so it was this constant search by my parents to, to find that, uh, you know, the right church. And so I experienced uh -huh. all the different kind of denominations. On my mom's side, I went to a Catholic school. So uh -huh. I got a taste of the Roman Catholicism as well, you know, mass every Friday and religion class, you know, all my friends did first communion and I actually didn't because I was coming from a more Protestant background on my dad's side. And so they would always tell me, don't pray to Mary, <laughs> you know, they're going to teach you all that bad stuff. Don't, don't believe it, you know? Yeah. So I didn't get involved in any of the, uh, uh, you know, the sacraments or whatever over at the Roman Catholic church. There were times where I sort of started to get into it and, uh, and started to, question God and stuff. And then I started to see a lot of the problems with Protestantism and it, and it just rubbed me the wrong way as sort of fake, you know, yeah. fake and, and, and silly and, and cringe and all that, especially as I got older and I started to question things more. What really did it for me is actually watching an episode of Anthony Bourdain's uh, uh, No Reservations. He was in like <laughs> Abu Dhabi or whatever, talking to this uh, Mus Muslim taxi cab driver. And the, and the cab driver tells him, yeah, I just, I feel Allah in my heart. I know he's real. Like, I know he's the true God, you know, and that's why I'm Muslim. And I'm like, that's exactly what my parents say about Christ and about God. Like, so, okay, yeah. this is all just silly. Like, uh -huh. this is every, you know, like it, everybody thinks this. So it must be that nothing's right, you know, that oh. nothing's right. So it pushed me really, really hard out of that. And, and from that point on, 
I was very much, you know, at times a hardcore atheist, like, no, it's all fake and I don't believe it. And then at other times more agnostic, like, you know, I mean, I, I was sort of floating along. I always say lost at sea, you know? Yeah. I was uh, brought up Protestant. My family was pretty, sh pretty strictly Nazarene uh, mm -hmm. most of my life. Once we moved to Idaho, uh, my family found a church here, um, and it was charismatic Pentecostal. I didn't know anything about this kind of stuff at that time because this was uh, this was six yeah six years ago now. It's kind of weird to think about that. Um, and they uh, they started to get really excited about it because it seemed you know very exciting to you know have all these new endeavors with the Holy Spirit that they could go about. <laughs> and yeah. I never really I never really. Uh, <laughs> got into it too much because I was the kind of kid for a while where I would still claim to be Christian, but I would never be excited to go to church or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It was not something that I um, was look would be looking forward to throughout the week because I'd always miss my football games at 11 a.m. or, what oh, <laughs> or he, whatever. Yeah. It really started to kick off when I went to college uh, because when I went to college, it was my first year, uh, and this is during the whole COVID crisis oh, for yeah. america because everything was online it got me thinking about what i wanted to do with my life because i thought for sure i was going to be a lawyer i uh, wanted to be wow. a corporate attorney for a while uh, i could zoom through school because covid made college just so unbelievably ridiculous i can't even explain i, I mean yeah. i would say 75 percent of my college experience was online and so i was like all right you know boise's got a nice law school for corporate attorney we're gonna go ahead and do that uh, but it still just didn't it got to a point where i didn't feel like i was you know doing anything tangible or like accomplishing anything that was yeah. really important to me. it got to a point where my uh my family started to get more you know more into the idea of like speaking in tongues and things like that <laughs> and i wasn't i wasn't about that yeah uh, and so i just started asking myself some more questions specifically about the bible itself because um, in Protestant realms, as we all know, it's, it really comes down to what I want to interpret the Bible to be. And I remember reading something about, I don't want to know what I think about the Bible. I want to know what God is trying to actually mm -hmm. tell me yeah. <laughs> through his word. Oh. And uh, yeah, I was convinced of this believer's baptism thing. Oh, and yeah. I was like, oh man, dude, you know, the, the Baptists have got it down. You know, these guys know what's up. You have to actually know what you're getting into before you, uh, mm -hmm. you know, before you're actually brought into the invisible church. <laughs> and so after, I'll never forget when I came up out of that water, um, I knew there was something wrong. It, it just, there was, it wasn't right at all. Um, there was no change in my heart or spirit. I didn't have any want to get away from like my usual sinful actions that I would normally always do. Mm -hmm. Unknowingly, I unknowingly had pagan beliefs. I was not raised Christian. My parents were not self-professed atheists, but they were definitely not Christian. And there was actually a lot of callousness towards Christianity in my household. About how ridiculous Christianity is, certain family members would refer to God irreverently as Sky Daddy. And my first real introduction to Christianity by a self-professed Christian, my dear young friend, was that of fire and brimstone and torture. I was disgusted about structure and again not concerned with validity or truth really, only your truth, which is not truth at all. And that's what was attractive to me about these pagan practices that I did not know were pagan at the time. I felt like I was communing with the divine partaking in spirituality, but there was no structure I had to keep up with, no behavioral nor moral accountability whatsoever, so I could still partake in sin, which I did not know I was a slave to at the time. I didn't have to wake up before 8 on Sundays to go to church or try to change my behavior for the better. I just had to keep doing what I was doing and partaking in whichever pagan practices felt right to me at the time. I turned 21 years old, I want to say, and I just inexplicably stopped prioritizing any kind of spirituality in my life. I was just concerned with work and friends and stuff, and the spiritual aspect of my life just took a complete sidestep. And that is until I had a conversation with a friend about morality one day. This was a completely random discussion too. She was trying to explain how morality is purely subjective, purely relative, and changes over time. And I, even being effectively atheistic at the time, even after my little unknown pagan phase, 
I was not convinced. She was talking about how murder, for instance, is not necessarily objectively moral, even though she personally believed it's immoral. She was also talking about how that could change in a couple of centuries because morality changes all the time. And although I was certain there was objective morality, I could not justify it at all without, without saying, well, if there's a god, then there's objective morality. And she admitted that I was right. If there is a god, then there is objective morality. And that was the first conversation I really ever had about objective morality that woke me up to the truth about what my belief system is and how unbelievably flawed it is. But I did not want to let go of my atheistic beliefs that easily. These atheistic thinkers would always become so obtuse when challenged with the topic of objective morality. And it was extremely frustrating for me because I did not believe in God, but understood the necessity of God's existence for objective morality to exist. And after finally understanding that, I began to identify effectively as a deist. I believed in God, but just not the Christian God. Yeah, I grew up in an Anglican household. My father was an Anglican priest, a traditional you know, high church Anglican. My mother's father was actually from Greece. So we have a slight, uh, you know, we have from my father, uh, my grandfather from Greece came over when he was in his teens, married a German. They decided to go to the Anglican church back in the 30s. Oh. There were very few Orthodox churches. So my mother was raised as an Anglican. But down deep, I think they had a zeal for holy tradition. And, and they understood the you know, they they actually were very active against all of the innovations that were going on at the time in the 80s. They were, they were, my mother was one of the leaders in the traditional slash conservative uh, Anglicans in America. So... You know, after it was apparent in 1989 uh, at a big gathering in Phoenix that things were just going from bad to worse, they really said, we need to go look at an Orthodox church. And we My dad, he chose to raise me. He's Catholic, so he, you know, he chose to raise me in the that religious tradition. And there are a lot of positives from it, uh, including respect for tradition and mm -hmm. basic knowledge of the gospel, morality, things like that. And, and that was, you know, both my mom and my dad were great parents. And, you know, as far as religion goes, my, my dad really, he gave me the most valuable gift that anyone uh, could receive, I think, and, and that he, he taught me how to pray when I was a kid. He encouraged me in my faith, always reinforced the, the belief, the knowledge that God is with us and that, you know, he who is in the world, nothing, you know, compared to he who is within you. So... I went to a Catholic school, you know, K to 12, really. I mean, K to, I mean, including Georgetown, that was, you know, all the way to through college. I was born in the early 80s, so it was the whole post-Vatican II environment. And uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was, I always felt kind of out of place with the, the way they did the masses. Like, you know, we'd go to mass every week, even as a little kid, you know, like we'd go to mass every week. You know, like once a month, like the whole school would go. You know, they'd have like the guitar and the bongo drums and the piano. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the kids, they, uh -huh. they'd have the kids go down the aisles with the streamers. And I just remember thinking like, this, this is goofy, you know, like, what? Well, are we supposed to be serious or? <laughs> I yeah. don't know. <laughs> then looking back, you know, going to Catholic school, a lot of, uh, a lot of kids that I grew up with, you know, they don't go to church and they don't do anything yeah. anymore. You know, it's like they kind of turn have turned away from it and there's there's various reasons for that you know mm -hmm. including the whole the scandal side and yeah. but it is sad you know it's 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 was raised in the los angeles area i was one of my only in my friend group i was the only mormon in the group but overall i had like a really happy well-adjusted childhood um nothing really weird at all that happened um and i just considered myself like another you know version of christian um and that's usually how i frame you know my belief system to my friends who were usually completely like a religious my upbringing was really nice because uh, the nice thing about the mormon community is they have a lot of activities for kids like good friend group um and it was just really family friendly atmosphere like i come from a family of six kids so mm -hmm. you know i have a lot of siblings and we're all really close i say like up until high school I, they have you do seminary. So before you go to school, I actually had to wake up at like 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. and do like what we call scripture study, where you're studying either like the New Testament, Old Testament, or some of the other Mormon books in the canon. Even during that time, like 
going through the seminary classes, I never really thought something was amiss when it came to Mormonism. Like, I never heard any kind of talking points against Mormonism from any of my friends. That was like kind of pre-internet, so I, I was never exposed to any kind of like apologetics, counter-apologetics to Mormonism. It wasn't until I went on a Mormon mission. Um, I actually did my mission out in Ohio, which... Oh. If you know anything about Mormon history, there's a lot of Mormon history in Ohio, and it's not all good history. So it wasn't until I got out there that I, for the first time in my life, encountered, like, real arguments against Mormonism. People claiming that it had more sordid history than, you know, I was raised to believe. So, yeah, that was kind of, I would say, when I started to really question just in small ways, like, okay, this isn't as straightforward as we're the restored Church of Jesus Christ. Yeah. My approach was always like, hey, I'm going to try to argue for my worldview out of the Bible. I'm going to try to show them that there was an actual ecclesiology in the New Testament times. You know, we don't, we say prophets and apostles, but I, I've used scriptures like in Ephesians to talk about how, you know, the church is built on the foundation of prophets and apostles. And, you know, he called teachers and prophets and apostles in Ephesians 4. So I would use like a lot of Bible scriptures because honestly, like I just felt like it was a better way to go. But there were like random times where someone would just point out something extremely obvious to me. Like I'll never forget this one kid. He was like, well, how come you guys believe like you have to be married to make it to heaven or at least the highest level of heaven? But here Paul says it's better not to marry. Like obviously Paul is speaking like very um, highly of the ascetic life. Like, for the first time, I was just, like, completely stumped, and I, I had no idea, like, how to make sense of that. I didn't ever go into atheism, but it definitely, like, made me a little more nihilistic, I would say, in, like, post-mission life. Like, I went to college in San Diego. I was pretty worldly. Like, um, I would go to church every Sunday, but I didn't go to the temple, you know, as often as you were supposed to. I thought it was weird in the temple. Mm -hmm. So I guess I just became a little more, like, disenchanted with like religion in general, but I was never like a cringe, you know, fedora <laughs> sipping atheist. I, I actually started reading um, apologetics against atheism. Uh, my upbringing was, was very good overall, religiously speaking, um, very, very little. Yeah, you know, I would go to Sunday, I'd go to church with my grandma from, you know, age six to 10 every, I don't know, every couple weeks, every month. But I was very minimal, it was very limited. And then from age 10 to 20, I basically had no, almost no religious uh, influence directly. I would, I went to church just a handful of times in that whole ages 10 to 20. But it was freshman year of college that a, um, a Protestant ministry that was actually focused on reaching college golfers, of which I was one. Wow. Um, yeah, pretty pretty focused, but they, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know they um, they reached a lot of people, and I was one of them. And um, through a long, very rational, focused, you know, very much like how can we know that Jesus is who He says He is? How can we know the resurrection is true? Um, very rational approach to things. Through some ups and downs over, I think about a year and a half of being really interested and then backing totally away and then getting interested again by God's grace. You know, he helped in that process to finally reveal to me that I needed, I needed a savior. I needed that my sin was real. It wasn't just something people talked about as a theory, but it was something very real that I not only committed, but needed help overcoming. And yeah. so I became a Protestant Christian from uh, late 2010 for a few years, I'd, I'd, I'd become a Calvinist. Mm. <laughs> uh, I'd gotten really into that theology, which I look back on and, and uh, it's extremely sad and tragic theology. But I was, in, I was involved with that and at a really healthy parish, a really healthy sacramental kind of liturgical parish oh. that, didn't, that didn't make a big focus on Calvinism. But nonetheless, was you know adhered to that theology. I think it's like a more very traditional American family, the nuclear family. Um, in terms of church, I always attended. I know when I was very young, my family attended a Baptist church, and then after that, we went to a house uh, or a church called Warehouse Ministries. It was like very non-denominational, evangelical coffee shop, you know, in the church there. Yeah. So it was. Uh, I, I felt even at a young age, and you know, I. I 
I'm, I'm thankful that my parents kind of exposed me to Christianity, even in that form. But I felt like even at a young age, I would always just kind of draw. And I felt like it uh, during service. I felt like it was like kind of spiritually hollow. I th- even kind of, even at a young age, I thought it was kind of cheesy, you know, for lack of better words. Yeah. So I was like constantly distracted. In my teenage years, I kind of stopped going. My family kind of fell away from the faith. I think my dad really used it as a tool to kind of give us a moral compass. But as my older brother, who's eight years older than me, he moved out of the house. In my teenage years, I got into skateboarding and punk rock. I just kind of like completely, (laughs) besides going to like a youth group skate park every other Friday, you know, that was pretty much my only interest in church at that point. As many people may know, it's like in the punk or even underground music subculture, it often skews very leftist. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I kind of felt like, I love the aspect of extreme music. I love the heaviness, even the community that it brought, but I never really bought in. And I think it was more so my dad kind of countering that with his traditional conservative politics. I never really brought bought into like kind of like the, the Marxist ideology that kind of like, you know, that was like an underlying current in that entire subculture kind of fell away from it. Just due to that. A lot of my friends, we got into, as we got more deeper and deeper into like underground subcultures of punk, we got into uh, crust punk, which is like very heavy, like veganism, anarchism, yeah. animal liberation, ext- like extreme ecology, you know, like environmental, like pretty much borderline of my environmental terrorism, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of fire bombing, like hum- Hummer, like uh, dealerships and things like that. Mm-hmm. I just felt like that was way too extreme for me. I said, man, I just, I just like the music, you know, I like going to shows. I love yeah. the music. I love that. We kind of shared this, like this common thread of like, we're, we're kind of angry, disillusioned with society, but it, it often manifested in like extreme leftist politics, which I just like, like I said, I was fundamentally kind of raised against. I think it kind of circled back around. I kind of fell away from that music. And when I was 21, my dad was always like relatively conservative, but it was like, more kind of like neocon George W. Bush, you know, kind of, <laughs> you know, just like the typical like kind of Reagan Republican. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like in my late teens and early twenties, he started reading a lot more like twentieth century, like more traditional conservative politics. Mm. That it was like because a lot of those guys like George Bush and things like that era, they were like really big business kind of like corporate Republicans, and I felt like my dad felt like that was essentially betrayed was betraying like the fundamental like values of the country you know he started as he got more into kind of i guess older traditional conservatism i was exposed to thinkers like julius evola Rene ganon frederick nietzsche and while he was going more like more like the materialist like political route i saw these thinkers and like i mean if you're familiar with like Rene ganon or julius evola they were like very much kind of into like Western esotericism, yeah. what they coined like perennialism, you know, that uh, there are all these traditions, Hinduism, even Sufism, um, a lot of early European paganism, mm-hmm. that essentially there was this like common, like golden thread that ran throughout all, all these traditions that kind of bonded it. It really is like syncretism, kind of universalism, but just very elitist that like, <laughs> in the sense that, you know, yeah. you need to be like uh, initiated into like this, essentially this like ancient tradition or these mystery schools. I'm definitely guilty. And I look now, look back, I'm so guilty of like ch- what I criticize, like new age crystal girls of doing, which is like <laughs> cherry picking, you know, aspects of different traditions. Yeah, I totally did that. I totally did that. I didn't buy in wholesale to Hinduism, but I said, oh, you know, I love the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. I like the aesthetic of Nordic paganism. I'm Northern European, but there's there's really not much there in terms of tradition. And the funny thing about it, I didn't really ascribe to any morality. It was like, wow, yeah, it was, it, it was, it was strictly like an intellectual endeavor to me, you know, mm-hmm. um, which just, I carried on a more degenerate lifestyle, just drinking inebriation, living for myself. But I thought like I was very elitist and that I, I get this, I get, you know, (laughs) I understand more. I know about this ancient ancient secret knowledge. (laughs) I'm like, I kind of held myself like very pretentiously above other people. Meanwhile, I was living like really just a slave to my passions and my desire. That things were just going from bad to worse. They really, 
said, we need to go look at an Orthodox church. And it was just after the, remember back in 88, they had this mass conversion of the evangelicals. Oh, yeah. And so there were more priests in North, my mother and father were in North, Northern California at the time. I was away at college. And so there were more pr um, convert priests out there and they were, they were able to come into contact with one. They went to a local church and, and the rest is kind of history. And, the, and my father's parish, about 150 people became Orthodox in 1992. Oh. I was away at the University of Wisconsin, which is, you know, if you know University of Wisconsin, Madison, it's the Berkeley, they call it the Berkeley of the Midwest. Where about halfway through that, my, my mother and father called me and said, we're becoming Orthodox. And I said, what's that? I, never heard. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of knew there was something called Orthodoxy in the world, but I never yeah. entertained it. So I visited a local Greek church, a very simple, beautiful little parish of immigrants, but uh, it was a Vesper service. They had it uh, partly in English uh, and... Uh, and there was a, you know, a priest and, and, a, and an old lady. And that was it. But I felt, yeah. I felt I was in another world. Yeah. I walked in. I was considering going to Catholicism. I was reading. I was going to the Roman Catholic Church. I had left Anglicanism even before my parents because I, I could see that it was just bankrupt. Yeah. And um, so, but I walked in the Orthodox Church and that was, I think my heart converted immediately. Just felt like I was in another world. And so when I, and I closed the door, went back to the, you know, the street I said, that's another world. That's not anything I ever experienced. So it took me about a year to, to intellectually embrace it, or eight months. First book I read, which was pretty amazing, was Orthodox and Religion in the Future. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Which is not, this is not the book you read when you become, you know, yeah. not the first book people give you, hey, you want to become Orthodox, here's Orthodox and Religion in the Future. But it was perfect for me because I was an activist. I was, I was, you know, uh, fighting, let's say, the good fight. I was uh, doing uh, sit-ins in front of abortion clinics. I was very active wow. in in uh, in the pro-life movement so uh, it answered a lot of questions immediately and i and i got over this hump that i think a lot of people in the west have and that is pretty quickly although it was a serious challenge was well where's orthodoxy like where is it in the culture where is it in the society why isn't it doing anything it doesn't appear anywhere as doing you know good works etc etc because that's the that's the, the moralism of the west it mm -hmm. dominates you know most of uh, heterodoxy is this approach to christianity as you know doing good works etc and i understood implicitly <laughs> pretty quick that uh they they're they're uh, something like in the emergency room and they're doing amazing work on you know extreme uh trauma but they don't know how to they don't know how to heal the whole person they don't the, the cancer that is eating away at all of society and every human being is not healed uh in outside of uh, uh orthodoxy and indeed outside of a very active spiritual life in orthodoxy it's not just to become orthodox because there are plenty of orthodox who are very nominal You've got to go deep. You've got to have a spiritual father and apply the therapy. And so once I understood that orthodoxy gave that, which could not be take, you know, given anywhere else, and they're healing the whole person, then, I, then it was fine. And I understood that this is where I needed to be. And so I, you know, I embraced orthodoxy in 92 uh, in, uh, in Wisconsin, and then eventually made my way to Mount Athos in 96, and then stayed in Greece from 98 uh, on. But um, for, for most of my life, like, I was a, a truth seeker, you know, I, I knew that, you know, whatever I felt that was true and believe, like, how can I say this? I was an opinionated person, you know, I was always the kid in school that would like go on rants and like, <laughs> you know, I was a very hardcore, like political lefty yeah. anarchist. Yeah. We got to fight the system. You know, I was trying to do good. You know, I saw bad yeah. in the world. I was trying to, to stand for what was right and true and good, but I just didn't know what that was. And so that's how I, I was able to get out of that because the end of the day i believed that stuff because i thought it was true and when i realized that i didn't have a leg to stand on this stuff wasn't true i you know i changed my opinion which thank god because i see a lot of people today um who are you know my age who still have beliefs like that as far as anarchism atheism or whatever that's their opinion that they associate their identity with and then if they're confronted with you know facts or or arguments that they can't best it doesn't matter if their position isn't true to them because it's what they are it's them you know they associate yeah. their identity with it whereas me i was always more of the truth seeker type where it's like i was happy to be proven wrong if you prove me wrong i'm like sweet thank you so much now i know something else that's true 8 a.m rush limbaugh would come on and so a lot of mornings i would wake up and me and my little left wing <laughs> activist guy, you know, I'm here rush. I'm, oh my goodness. I have to get up and shut it off. And then some mornings I would be too tired to get up. And so I would just lay there for a while. And it was actually listening to Rush Limbaugh <laughs> that I started to realize like, 
oh, maybe there's something to the conservative side. Like maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> and that started wow. to push me out of the out of the left wing thing. Just from hearing the arguments where I'm like, yeah, we are kind of stupid. Like, yeah, we are kind of silly. Like the left wing thing is kind of ridiculous. And slowly, I started to become more of a conservative. And this was right around 2015, right when Trump oh, was yeah. starting to run. The establishment is more of this liberal establishment. I mm -hmm. So, you know what I mean? It's yeah. dialectics. And, um, and, and going through the whole Trump presidency and seeing all of this take place and, and really having my illusion shattered over the course of those five years, um, it coincided right along the time that I started to discover orthodoxy. I started to stumble across videos by Jay Dyer, Tristan mm. Haggard, all those guys. And uh, I started to realize, oh, I actually don't know anything about Christianity. Like I was raised Christian and I know Christ, I know the Bible stories and stuff, but I don't know anything about the theology of it and like the actual underpinnings of it. And the whole time that, you know, I'm discovering this was right around the time I was always watching lectures on YouTube, always reading books, always trying to seek truth, you know? And so I was like super into reading occult books and, you know, Hermeticism and Rosa Crucia, all this uh, Kabbalah, all of it. And, um, I was, I was diving like super deep trying to find this truth and then realizing like, okay, I might find like a nugget of truth or this little kernel in like this big, you know, esoteric tome of like you know occult whatever and then i'm listening to this like orthodox christian where it's just constant truth you know what i mean like yeah. so much and realizing like wow like there, there's really something here that i that i never knew before you know that, that maybe there's something to the christianity thing and so i started to look more into it and um thank god you know what i mean thank god i did because wow i mean my, my life has changed so much in the last two three four years that it's it's almost it's it's really incredible, um, and I have so much uh, gratitude and thanks to uh, Jay and the Tristan, especially Tristan, because you know it was through watching Jay's stuff that I started to really understand more about the Orthodox Christian mm -hmm. position, what we believe, what what the Church teaches. But then it was Tristan who was you know talking with me privately and like really helping me sort of drop my old worldviews and stuff and, and sort of understand the Orthodox Christian. Fronema, I guess, better, you know? Yeah. And uh, he was the one of, eventually that told me, he was like, okay, because I got to this point where I believed in orthodoxy for a while, but I wasn't going to church. I was, it was just like, I got the opinion. I'm, I'm orthodox. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, and he was the one that was like, so are you going to church? And I was like, no, I, I haven't gone to a church yet. And he's like, well, uh, here's one that's three blocks from your house. Go, go, go there. <laughs> so I felt like, yeah. I got to go now because he's going to think I'm stupid if I don't go. <laughs> so I ended up going and, yeah. and glory to God, I've uh, I've been, I was baptized, I want to say a year and a half, two years ago. Wow. And um, yeah, I mean, glory to God, man. It's, it's, it's really incredible how, uh, how much God transforms and changes your life. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I actually was started getting into Christian apologetics because Mormonism doesn't really have an answer to atheism at like an academic you know, level. So, yeah, I, I was never an atheist, but again, like, I became less interested in Mormonism over time, and I became more interested in, like, Christian apologetics. I was yeah. really into, like, libertarian politics. Mm -hmm. um, that was also becoming, like, my new religion in a way. <laughs> I didn't find um, orthodoxy until about a few years ago, and I'm in my mid-30s now. Um, so it was actually well after college. So I would say I was just really into trying to find um, like the true version of Christianity and history. Um, I mean, but the thing is, is the, here's the thing about like anti-atheist apologetics. Like if you're watching like someone like William Lane Craig, I mean, he's obviously the most famous person arguing with atheists. I mean, it, it's good to know those talking points, but it honestly serves, it can serve as a distraction because what William Lane Craig is describing is natural theology. And as we all know, it's not really narrowing it down to who we're worshiping and how we're worshiping. It's just narrowing it down to this God that the Muslims and the Jews can also claim. It wasn't until I discovered um, Jay Dyer uh, <laughs> when, a few years ago. I mean, yeah, big shocker there. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I discovered him um, that I actually found someone who was really narrowing it down as far as like connecting those apologetic talking points to actual history of Christianity, like marrying the two together. Mm -hmm. um, I, that was the first time I had ever heard of that. I mean, even like Catholic 
apologists rarely were making arguments from like the church fathers. They usually heard them quoting Aristotle, yeah. um, which, which is just quite, it's just quite weird because I get it. Like Aristotle and the first cause arguments work when you're talking to an atheist, but they don't narrow it down for you to actually find, you know, where the church is and where can we see it in history. It was the first time I was ever challenged in, in my specific worldview because if you listen to like someone like William Lane Craig, like he will mention here and there, like, yeah, Mormons aren't real Christians, but that's not really like what he's arguing for is a specific type of Christianity that excludes other, you know, heretical or schismatic groups. So when Jay Dyer would argue for the Orthodox worldview, um, you know, using things like the transcendental argument for God and, and this whole idea of coherentism, you know, actually making sense of the world through a specific worldview. Yeah. I mean, I never had seen apologetics done that way. And, and then also just hearing Jay Dyer say that Mormonism is a cult, uh, people think like, oh, that's really mean. That's not charitable. Um, well, it was the first time that someone just straight up said it, but then could back it up with actual historical arguments. Like, here's why it's a cult. It took me, I'd say, a couple of years. Um, and the reason is because I'm married. I, I have yeah. little ones. And... Um, it's just like a big move because my entire family is like very Mormon. They're very active in the church. And so honestly, it was just like fear of the, re the social repercussions of yeah. coming out and saying like Mormonism isn't true. But I did tell my wife probably like a year and a half in, um, hey, I just don't think Mormonism is true. I've been like studying a lot of the history of Christianity and theology, um, and I just don't find it a compelling worldview. And um, there's a lot of problems with it, too. Yeah. And so I, I didn't, like, you know, come out swinging. I wasn't trying to be, like, you know, bashing it because I know it's, like, still yeah. something that was really important to her at the time. Mm -hmm. But it honestly, like, it, it broke her heart. And it was just kind of like a, a bit of a struggle between us as far as, like, me telling her, like, because she did ask me at that time, like, what do you think is true? Like, are you an atheist now? Like, you know, she was just a little worried about the, uh, you know, instability that I might have been bringing to the marriage. Yeah. But at that time, I could say, you know what, I, I think it's the Orthodox Church. Like, it seems to have, like, the best um, justification for its system of worship and belief and theology. Honestly, it was kind of, like, you know, bleak, thinking about us being, like, an inner yeah. state marriage, whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was just very bleak, but I, I kind of just never really felt too, like, down about it for some reason. I always just kind of had hope, like, that truth would win out. Um, and my wife, to her credit, she's super open-minded like at no point did she ever like get angry or belligerent with me or defensive like she just knew that I was trying to be closer to Christ at the end of the day like I think she could see that and how I was talking about these things with you know trying to have charity but also trying to speak truth and boldness so yeah I would say what really like it's actually funny the, the story is like we were watching the general conference it's like a worldwide conference where the Mormon prophets and apostles um, come and speak to the world but mainly just Mormons and they watch it on their TV, and it's filmed out of Salt Lake. Well, at that time, they supported a really controversial bill here in Arizona where we live. Um, I won't go into the details of it, but it was basically just a super pro skittles bill. Um, oh, yeah. And the LDS Church actually, like, came in full support of it. And at that general conference, they basically told all of us, like, you need to be okay with us, wow. you know, supporting things like this. Like, this is the march. Progress marches <laughs> on, right? At that point, she watched that, and she was like, all right, let's go check out the Orthodox Church. So I was like, all right, and so am I. When I started to really wrestle with some of the theological points of Calvinism, at some point it started to all fall apart. Uh, as, I, as I've said to people, uh, my tulip wilted. Mm. <laughs> Anyone familiar with Calvinism will know what I mean by that. And I, and I found myself in a place, this was uh, 2013, um, Oh, yeah, and, and I'd actually already been to an Orthodox church once. Wow. I'd been to an Orthodox church once. Uh, a friend of mine who I had a class with in college, after we both graduated, he reached out to me and, and uh, said, hey, oh, hey, how you doing? What's going on? And they gave me this long paragraph about Orthodoxy. <laughs> and that was my first time ever hearing anything about Orthodoxy, at least that I can remember. And... Um, and we started d discussing uh, orthodoxy and, you know, different views on Christianity and all that. Um, so I went with him to the parish here and here where I live. And 
thought it was strange. I didn't understand it. Even with my like kind of liturgical Protestant uh, experience at that point, you know, I understood the, okay, it's liturgical, there's sacraments, all that, but it was so strange to me. It was so, you know, I didn't have that experience that a lot of people or some people at least have where they come in and it feels like home. Mm. It feels like everything they've been looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. That was not my experience. The first Orthodox book I read, and it, and it really made an impact on me, was Way of the Pilgrim. Oh, yeah. Uh, I haven't actually read it since. I really need to. But it, it made a very distinct impact on me, and I, I really couldn't put the book down. You know, I'd, I'd read some other things about ecclesiology, about, you know, defense of the one true church being the Orthodox church. I had read uh, Father Alexander Schmemann. I was reading, but also talking with a couple Orthodox Christians about my my concerns and, and my issues. Icons, as you mentioned, that those are definitely one of them. Yeah. How to relate to the Virgin Mary. I understood Orthodoxy wasn't Roman Catholicism. Yeah. But it didn't seem it didn't seem like what I was uh, orth thinking Christianity and being a Christian would really look like. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't. But in the midst of my Calvinism just crumbling and my whole Protestant foundation crumbling, realizing that Protestantism is not connected in reality in, in time and space to the church, that I knew I wanted to be a Christian. I knew I wanted to be with Jesus Christ, but I didn't know how to do that anymore. I felt completely unsure about how to do that. And so it was in that place that I started to think, I, if, if orthodoxy is going to be anything to me, I need to be, I need to actually go to church. I need to, to try to pray the prayers. I need to try to enter into the life of the church as much as one can as, a, as an inquirer. And, and so I knew books are helpful, but they're not going to be what helps me understand orthodoxy at the deeper level that it would really need. So... Over the course of four or five months, I started regularly attending the services. I tried to pray the prayers. I had icons. I try to really, as I say, as I've said to people, kind of put on orthodoxy and, and walk as an orthodox Christian step by step in ways. Um, still reading, of course, but, but that was really, I felt like God uh, in that process showed me so many things about the truth of orthodoxy. I felt like there were so many little moments of clarity reading the scriptures and understanding really what they meant more and understanding what liturgical prayer, um, the beauty of it, the meaning of it, how it's very real and, you know, all these kind of uh, objections that I had been embracing or had been told about before were falling apart. The more I went to church, the more I engaged and tried to live an Orthodox life, tried to I think I was trying to fast at that point too. I, I'm pretty sure I wasn't holding back on those kind of things wow. either. So, yeah, I found I found um, Orthodox Christianity through honestly, I think literature online, being on Twitter, and having some friends that were sending me content from Sarah from Rose and Sarah from Rose. I I didn't really, I, I that was really something new. That was really something super cool. I um. Yeah. I was unfamiliar with, with uh, orthodoxy but outside of, uh, I think, Byzantine, Russian history and real life history, but I hadn't really understood the difference between orthodoxy or Protestantism, Catholicism. My understanding of Christianity was pretty like, it was pretty, it was pretty like rudimentary. It was, um, it was uninformed. I, I didn't know anything. I ordered uh, orthodoxy and the religion of the future. I kind of just didn't read it for a while. I had a physical copy. I read it. I had also, in that time when I had ordered that copy, and my friend had told me about Sarah from Rose, went into the apologetics phase, left it. Then I picked up um, Orthodox and Religion in the Future. Mm -hmm. I actually picked up Soul to Soul After Death, and uh, they were both they were both really good. It was just it was so it was so well thought out. Yeah. Um, I think that reading nihilism. Um, I read it after, but nihilism is written before the other books. It isn't any other environment. Actually, you know, yeah, like totally, totally spiritual or holy, like you said. I mean, you walk into a Catholic church. I don't get that. I don't get that at, at all. It's 
And around this time, I inexplicably began to connect more with an old friend of mine who is now my husband and the father of my unborn baby. And he was and still is, of course, an Orthodox Christian who came to Christ independently after a very long spiritual journey himself. And before we began dating, my now husband invited me to his Orthodox church. And initially, I won't lie, I just wanted to have a nice place to go once a week and connect with wholesome people. I was not really interested in Christianity at all yet. And then my now husband gifted me this icon and this, oops, this prayer book and i thought what the heck i'll just take a crack at it so i began to pray with it with um with the prayers in the book and reading from the bible and shortly after starting to do this i began to experience a profound kind of peace that i never experienced before and i noticed that often i overthought things much less i was significantly less anxious in my day-to-day -day life and I was intrigued. And then I began to try to have a more personal approach to this spirituality thing. I not only utilized the prayer book and the Bible, I tried talking to God myself and asked him over and over, okay, are you actually there? Is someone there? Is someone listening? If you're, if you're listening, please let me know. If someone is there, please let me know please reveal yourself to me. And I kept on asking him. And one day, it was a random Wednesday afternoon, I remember it well, I came home and I felt the urge to pray out of the blue. So I pulled out my, my prayer book and I recited a prayer from St. Basil the Great. And all of a sudden, this unbelievable feeling rushed over me. The only way for me to really describe it is like, it's like the opposite of having your heart broken. Take the pain of having your heart completely shattered and reverse that level of extreme pain into extreme joy. It was not necessarily pleasurable. It was just this pure sensation of love, comfort, belonging, and peace. And comfort really being the operative word there. It was comfort, which is another name for the Holy Spirit, the comforter. It was maybe 15 minutes of this pure feeling of comfort and love. And I cried probably harder than I ever have cried before. And in that moment, I knew it was God. I was experiencing the very presence of God. And I couldn't deny it. I couldn't explain it away anymore. There was no way I could have tricked myself into feeling that. And up until that moment, I was still very unconvinced of God's ex existence. And then it was like a complete light switch. After a bit, I called my now husband, who was now just my friend at the time, about my encounter, telling him he was right about everything and how absolutely astounding the experience was and how amazing yet honestly frightening God actually exists. And all of a sudden, I realized that indeed there is an omnipotent, omniscient being who's been watching me and judging me my entire life. That's a pretty harrowing realization. I was both relieved that God exists because now life actually has purpose and there is such a thing as goodness, but I was also frightened because this means I really do have to make some extreme lifestyle changes. And shortly after that experience, I was thoroughly convinced of God's existence and began to dive into apologetic with a combination of the abundant evidence for Jesus's divinity and my own personal encounter with God through an Orthodox prayer, I was completely convinced of Christianity and became a catechumen, which is a convert under instruction before baptism. And then shortly after I was baptized and my baptism was one of the happiest days of my life. I had so many inexplicable realizations about God afterwards, after, after my, my baptism and taking my first communion. Like I realized that practically all the notions I had about God were completely false and unfounded. In the Orthodox Church, the scriptures are read without distortion. And thus the Orthodox Church is the custodian of truth because it possesses Holy Scripture, not its text only, but also its correct interpretation. God really put it on my heart to look into, you know, the, the Bible more and things of that nature and um, took me a little bit so after I got back from this trip from Florida it even it got became even louder of like you need to do you need to 
start looking into this kind of stuff, man. And I'll never forget, Kyle, the first video that I saw when I looked up on YouTube was Protestantism debunked in 15 minutes. I was wow. like, <laughs> it was awesome. It was awesome because I was just looking into this stuff. And I mean, dude, you're just spamming out all the thoughts that I've been holding in. And it was like not really too afraid to ask, but was like always told to not ask these kinds of questions because the Bible is always self-evident. You know, the scriptures are the scriptures and you don't, yeah. you don't need to ask ourselves where they came from mm-hmm. watching your stuff um it's like dude where has this been my entire life it's like i don't like at the time there was still a lot of ideas in the orthodox church that i was wrestling with coming from a protestant background how hebrew how it's always referencing um exodus and it talks about how uh, the sacrifice of the lamb is what covers our sins in the order of melchizedek and when, when melchizedek offered bread and wine to abraham as a you know as, as a picture of what was to come in the new covenant and it really got to a point, Kyle, where it's there is so much stacking up that if I were to stay Protestant in this mindset, I would have to be acting out a fool for the rest of rest of my life at that point, as it felt. You know, this this was last year, and so it, it's like, look, I can't I can't hold to this stuff anymore. And so I remember I was researching this stuff for um, pretty pretty intensely from about July to November before I even stepped into an Orthodox church and that faith is built upon only reading the scriptures and that's the only way to, but no it's ta- it's a direct reference to the liturgies mm-hmm. yeah it's, it's talking about <laughs> faith is built up when you are participating in the worship of God and uh, Jay is actually Jay Dyer is one of the first ones to point out to me that in the liturgies, the angels, the cherubim, the seraphim are all surrounding the congregants and the priests for the Eucharist because of the Holy Spirit himself. God himself is de- descending into the Holy of Holies or in, in our area, in the altar area, to give grace to the sacraments of the body and blood of Christ. And it's, I mean, dude, that, that's like, <laughs> like mind-blowing. Yeah. So the first time I stepped into the Orthodox Church, I'm Greek Orthodox, by the way. It's just how my schedule worked out. I love the priest there. He's... He's actually a former Rokar uh, parish priest, and so he's oh, awesome. He's to- he's completely <laughs> traditional. He's, he's a wonderful guy. I love him, and uh, he's he's been nothing but loving, and he doesn't he doesn't back down from truth, man. He's really typical East Coast University. They have these very old buildings. Yeah, and uh, my my dorm building, kind of this basement area, it had some little windows, but and it was all you know made of stone. And this this crypt was it was a little chapel and and it had icons in it and it was you know done in a little bit of eastern style and so it was, it was a oh. dark place it was quiet there were candles and they had these icons you know of the you know the mother of god with uh the infant christ and then one of christ pantocrator i loved going down there you know just uh and yeah i'd go down there like in the middle of the night just to hang out by myself and think or whatever yeah. and it was a beautiful place and and apparently I guess they they did, you know, an Orthodox priest would come and do services there once in a while. Though when I, when I was there, I never wow. um, was exposed to that. But I was a Russian major, and that was my other exposure to Orthodox Christianity. Was that, you know, I was I was very you know fascinated, interesting, interested in learning Russian, and you know, learning about Russian culture. And some of my professors were Orthodox, so that was great oh, exposure. Wow. And, uh, yeah, and, and I had, uh, I was, I was very, uh, lucky, you know, to, uh, see that. And in fact, one of my professors, um, you know, we did a, an independent tutorial on, um, Nikolai Berdyaev, the philosopher, I got to study him in depth. So it was, it was awesome. I, at the time though, more into, you know, it's, I, I just kind of still am, but, you know, I was always into stuff having to do with like the KGB and, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, Soviet intelligence operations, Cold War stuff. Hmm. That was, that always grabbed my attention. Like, I remember one time I ordered a book on, it was like an academic study of like contract killings in Russia and, you oh, know, man. kind of the crazy time of like the 1990s, you know, early 2000s. And, uh, and the book I got, I ordered it from Russia, you know, it was, it was this bookstore called Eastview. And they're, um, they, ha- they have a lot of cool books you can get straight from Moscow. But the book they sent me, they sent me the wrong book accidentally. And the <laughs> book they sent me was like, it was called, it was The Spiritual Roots of the Russian People. And I just looked at, I don't want to read this, you know, like yeah. it was, you know, in Russian. And, yeah. um, and I gave it to my, one of my professors. But, but at least God was trying to tell me, hey, like there's, there's other things to learn here. <laughs> yeah. And um, 
And, and ultimately, you know, like that study of Berzyayev's philosophy, that kind of, he has a great book on Dostoevsky. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that kind of led me to Dostoevsky and getting, getting more in depth with not only with Russian culture, but with orthodoxy, which, you know, it's kind of the, one of the main bases of, you know, the, the wellspring of Russian culture. So that was very influential, uh, kind of the tail end of college, you know, learning about Berdyayev, you know, reading different authors and, you know, kind of starting to get into Dostoevsky. I would say that I already started having, you know, I was, I, I already, I had a natural affinity towards that, towards yeah. orthodoxy, mm -hmm. uh, towards that mentality. Uh, that worldview and and it kind of became apparent to me yeah like like you know when i'd read about it or when i'd um you know see uh different things about the orthodox faith it just made sense to me you know yeah. um uh, you know it was at an instinctive level it um yeah it aligned i think uh i i then started you know, like after when I was already, you know, I was working in D.C. or whatever. And I started reading Seraphim Rose. Finally, I came upon oh, okay. Seraphim Rose. Yeah. I read Nihilism. Yeah. And that was that was that was a life changing book. You know, that was that was an amazing work. 2011 or so, I I, uh, I kind of had I don't know if it was an, it, went, it was an epiphany or just kind of the, you know, culmination point of, you know, uh, want you know kind of this growing consciousness of you know i, I want to become orthodox but yeah i went in and i think i originally went for vespers you know yeah um which is a great way you know if people who aren't orthodox like they want to try it out like um vespers is a is a, is a terrific thing to do first yeah. I, I felt i felt that yeah. that that holiness and that that feeling of reverence uh -huh. immediately you know and, and you feel like you're at home you feel like, oh, this is, this is where I'm supposed to be, you know, yeah. like this, uh, I'm meant to be here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I'm 33 and that, uh, that occurred probably within the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. I felt like I've always, um, just something in my heart, you know, for lack of better words, yeah. I knew I was Christian, but I was really disillusioned with it. I saw it as like just a worldly institution or more of a community that paid lip service to these things, but didn't really like didn't really have this strong spiritual program or anything that attached to it or tradition. I really was kind of wandering, just like kind of floating around out in the ether, you know, for about, <laughs> for about 10 years, yeah. just looking into all these different, I, I guess you can call them pseudo religions really, you know, or creating this own pseudo religion of my own. And I think within the past couple of years, I didn't know, I wasn't aware of orthodoxy at all. So I thought the most traditional form of Christianity was Catholicism which I think a lot of Americans yeah. inevitably kind of come to that conclusion. So while I was looking into Catholicism, I actually, matter of fact, stumbled upon one of your videos. And I forgot exactly what video it was. It might've been like your top, like Orthodox, uh, your, it was like a top books, top oh, 10 books in Orthodoxy, okay. something along the lines of that. Yeah. Um, so that really sparked my interest. And I gotta be honest, like coming from a background of listening to like punk music and metal music, I remember one of the vi videos, I think you, kind of edited in a lot of clips of like these monks that were rocking like the great scammer robes, you know? Oh, yeah. And I was just like, whoa, what is going on here? This is like very like, kind of like, I've always been more attracted to like dark macabre, like aesthetics, you know? Yeah. So I just needed to kind of explore that. And I think the first book I picked, it, picked up and I'm not necessarily sure where I was uh, recommended it by, maybe some website or something was The Way of the Pilgrim, mm -hmm. yeah. which is awesome book. At that time, I had barely been reading. I was borderline illiterate. I couldn't, I didn't have the attention span to sit through even like a chapter of a book. Yeah. So it was like a very short read, something that I could, uh, you know, digest easily, chew on. And it was extremely profound. The whole focus of the book is essentially on like uh, praying incessantly, prayer of the heart, the Jesus prayer. So that just, it really resonated with me. I said, it blew my mind. I said, I had no idea this was part of the Christian tradition. So from there, I was pretty much bought in, you know, uh, essentially like hook, line, and sinker. Like, I need to check out orthodoxy because yeah. I saw that even even in my brief stint of looking into Catholicism, what I thought was this ancient tradition has been like pretty much 
in the tendrils of modernity. You know, yeah. I feel like modernity's got, got everything, you know? Yeah. So I said, this is what I'm looking for, like completely. Like it has the aspect of ritual, the aspect, aspect of asceticism. When I, when I thought, yeah, I want to get back into Christianity, there was like probably a couple month period where I was looking into Catholicism and switched over. So I'd say it was, I don't know necessarily the exact timeline, but it was maybe a matter of like four to six months before I ever even stepped uh, foot in an Orthodox church. And that was really just due to bad habits of my past where I said, oh, I could be this lone practitioner or something, you know, it's just like me in my room reading these like ancient texts or something. It's, yeah. I didn't, I, it was, I got in the habit of this being like a strictly an intellectual endeavor. Like, yeah. you know, I, I could pray alone. I don't need to join this community or I, at the time I didn't realize like the body of the Christ is something on earth and you need to attach yourself to it. This is like, obviously just as important as your private prayer life or, you know, denying oneself and this personal asceticism is connecting yourself to the community of a church mm -hmm. and being under a priest or spiritual father, you know, the guidance of that. Cause there's, I know now, you know, the doctrine of pre you could be so easily knocked off your course or deceived by your own self, spiritual, you know, spiritual powers, what have you, you know? So it's uh, demonic, you know, demonic yeah. spiritual powers. I feel like it's, there's so much deception. So uh, the, the necessity of being in the church, being under a good priest, somebody that can give you guidance mm -hmm. and kind of has that discernment is super important. So the first time I ever stepped into church, it's, uh, it's funny how it worked. I honestly, it was just based on proximity. It was right around the corner from my house and it was actually the church you attend, you know? So that was, uh, that kind of blew my mind. I saw you're obviously an altar server saw you come out from behind the iconostasis like, whoa yeah that's kyle you know this is like pretty much the guy the dude who brought me to orthodoxy this it blew my mind and said this isn't a coincidence you know and luckily the the church i attended it was a, you know a serbian church um it was exactly what i was looking for the, i feel like they're one of the most traditional um haven't really given into modernity carried on the tradition um that's exactly what I was looking for. And it was really just kind of happenstance, you know, how I found it. Just went on Google. It was within a couple miles on my house and uh, it worked out great. It was, it was a beautiful experience. The first liturgy, I didn't know what was going on at all because I had, <laughs> I was kind of really up until that point, just focusing on like a lot of YouTube apologetics. That's what kind of swayed me over to the Orthodox position. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really focus on like, I guess the ritual, the liturgy. I didn't know anything about that. So I was kind of going in blind and it was just a, a beautiful experience. You know? Though I, I do live in Turkey, I wasn't, I, did, I wasn't born there. I was mm. born to Turkish parents, right? I was raised in the culture, but I was born and raised in Norway for nine years. Oh, and then I moved okay. religion. I don't talk about my like personal life too much, but yeah. what I can talk about in terms of religion is that pretty much for most of my life, I didn't really care about religion. Um, mm -hmm. I sometimes flip between agnostic atheism and agnostic theism, but consistently with agnosticism. At some point, I was, you know, I was kind of more atheistic. Sometimes I was like, well, I guess God does exist, but if he does exist, I don't really care. Like, I kind of had that kind of a viewpoint. I didn't really care about it until really 2015, 16, and the, the aftermath of like a lot of what happened in 2016 is what made me start to take religion more seriously. I started to respect it a lot more. I always respected it. I always had some kind of fondness towards Christianity that my upbringing might have something to do with it because as I said, I've lived in Norway, right? Yeah. Uh, but I always liked Christianity, I always respected it. And w once I, I always had this idea about religion where like religion is just this, you know, religion is just this, you know, you just go to church or whatever, you do some prayers and you go home, you, you feel better about yourself. And that's just what religion is. Right? I just thought that's what it was about. And when I started to realize that there's in fact a worldview, there's like what I will call like a war behind various different religions. Uh, there's a logic behind it. There's a metaphysic yeah. behind it. I took it like I really start to respect uh, Christianity specifically a lot more due to its history and due to mm -hmm. kind of thought that goes into it. And just, it kind of just started from that. And, you know, there was also some reasons that I won't really endorse today, but like kind of stuff like, you know, I, one of the reasons I became Orthodox because, well, you know, it's the religion of the lands that I, I lived in, right? It's kind of like, you know, the religion, I guess for me, and it's more traditional and it has a much better claim of being the religion of, 
you know, the early church fathers and so on and so forth. But then afterwards, I start to realize, you know, better reasons for it. I guess the, the fact that it's the religion that Christ established, right? It's, yeah. It's a really good religion. It's like a really good reason for being an Orthodox Christian, right? But I will basically say that these will be the main factors for what uh, helped me become an Orthodox Christian. Yeah, I've been, I've been living in Turkey for a couple of years. And uh, I guess I should also mention this. I was baptized. I, I went to the United States to study for one and a half years. Mm-hmm. I was baptized as an Orthodox Christian there. Ever yeah. since then, I've I've moved to Turkey. I moved back to Turkey, and I've been living here ever since. Yeah, that's awesome. Wow, <laughs> you watch to the end. Good job. If you watch this far, comment your favorite Orthodox book. Maybe there's one that you haven't mentioned yet. I try to get all the Orthodox books that people recommend, and I want to do book reviews on them. And, in the future when I have time. If you want to share your story, reach out to my email. I really hope you enjoyed this. Thank you. God bless.